is my pleasure to introduce the dry bulk panel today. Uh, directly to my left is Yanis Zafirakis of uh, Diana Shipping. He's the Chief Financial Officer and Chief Commercial Officer. Next to him is Mr. Gary Vogel, CEO of Eagle Bulk Shipping. Uh, next to him is Mr. John Wobensmith, CEO and Director of Genco Shipping and Trading. And to my far left is Mr. Hamish Norton, a president of Starbulk Carriers. Welcome and thank you, gentlemen. Uh, to get right in, it, we'll start with Yanis. Um, you operate in the dry bulk sector. You have the option of allocating your assets to certain vessel classes. In some cases, uh, you'll concentrate in specific vessel classes. In other cases, diversify. Could you share with us your asset allocation strategy? And just as a, as a sub-discussion, could you talk about how you manage your fleet to differentiate your fleet and also drive returns out of your investment? First of all, thank you for, for having us here. Uh, we at Diana Shipping, we, we play a lot with the volatility of the market. So we choose our assets that they are of that kind in the dry bulk sector that they have this volatility that we want. We like the upper part of the cycle, we like the lower part of the cycle. So basically, we have concentrated all of our investments to the bigger sizes of the, of the dry bulk sector and also the ultra maxes lately that they have this uh, volatility that we like. At the end of the day, we consider ourselves to be fund managers that we invest uh, money and we manage money from our investors in the dry bulk sector and we are aiming for the proper risk reward ratio and um, uh, allocating um, the cash for buying assets also we pay a lot of attention in economies of scale and whatever sector we have in the dry bulk uh, uh, industry, we have to have a sizable uh, fleet. So that, that's how we do it. It's very simple. Simple but uneasy, I guess. Uh, very simple. <laughs> Gary? Yeah, so Eagle Bulk, uh, we're owners of 52 vessels. They're all between 55 and 63,000 deadweight, all focused Supermax and Ultramax vessels. And 50 out of 52 are scrubber fitted. Um, and there's two reasons. First, first of all, um, in, I've been in the, what was called the Hanimax, then the Supermax, now Ultramax sector, almost my entire career, 35 years in dry bulk. And these ships are unique because they're able to carry major bulk cargoes, do long haul, but also minor bulks. About two thirds of our demand comes from minor bulk. So my view, they're the most versatile ships. They all have their own cranes so we can load or discharge in ports without infrastructure. And so it, it's, it's really a, a asset class that has demonstrated over the past few years, you know, um, robust returns, superior returns, um, because of the less invested capital and the relative earnings. We're also focused on one asset class because we have an active operator model. So that means we are not just operating our 52 ships, we charter in vessels, we have a cargo book, we use derivatives. And simply put, having the operational uh, flexibility of, of substituting vessels and cargos um, enables us to end up with a better product, you know, call it cargo vessel arbitrage. Uh, whereas if we had a cape size vessel on a handy size vessel off Singapore, clearly they can't help each other in terms of one carrying the other cargo. So the focus within a tight band of just 8,000 dead weight is, is intentional and, and we think delivers um, out, outsized results uh, for our, for our uh, shareholders. Hi, I'm John Wobensmith. Uh, I run a company called Genco Shipping. We have 27 uh, ultra supermax vessels on the water and 17 cape size vessels. All the cape size vessels are fitted with scrubbers. So the way we look at fleet allocation, we actually call it our barbell approach, where we have direct exposure to all the dry bulk commodities, the capes focused on iron ore and uh, coal cargoes. We like the high beta, we like the volatility in the cape size sector. The way that we've structured our balance sheet from a very low leverage standpoint allows us to, 
to play that volatility and, and not lose sleep at night. But we also like that mid-sized vessel class, which provides a more stable earnings stream, a little more exposed to world GDP rather than just solely um, in, in China. In terms of how we run our fleet, as I said, we have the capes with scrubbers, so that gives us a, an advantage on the earnings side. We have a 10 to 11 year old fleet. We think that is the sweet spot from a return on invested capital standpoint as we believe the market is going to move up as we get into uh, next year. And then we've established a very robust uh, trading platform both in Singapore on the, in the Cape Size sector but also in New York and Copenhagen uh, in particular on the mid-size. And the whole idea is, as Gary was saying, to create optionality, outperform the indices, and, and create alpha for the, uh, for the overall fleet. And uh, I'm Hamish Norton, I'm president of Starbulk. Um, we have uh, 119 owned ships, um, eight ships chartered in. Um, almost all of the owned ships have scrubbers. Um, and very roughly, we try to keep about a third of our fleet being uh, Cape Size and Newcastle Max, which are the uh, in the range of 180,000 to 209,000 deadweight tons. Uh, roughly a third of our fleet in Panamax and Camser Max ships, which are sort of 75 to 85,000 tons. And roughly a third of our fleet in Supermax and Ultramax, which are about 52 to 64,000 tons. Um, we operate our capes in the voyage market, um, in the CCL pool, which we uh, jointly run with, with our partners in the CCL pool. Um, and our Supermaxes and our Panamax slash Camser Maxes, we operate in the, in the time charter market. Um, you know, our, our experience is that the, the time charter market gets us the vast majority of the, uh, of the income available to the smaller ships, whereas we find that we can squeeze out a little more return on the capes um, in the voyage market. Um, and also, interestingly enough, even with the, the smaller ships in the time charter market, we find that we get almost all the scrubber benefit for ourselves, so it, it is pretty efficient. Thank you, Hamish. Mm -hmm. uh, looking on the geopolitical front, uh, we can't ignore what happened this weekend in the Mideast, the tragedy there. Understanding it's still early days and, and how it affects the dry bulk sector. Could we get some sense as to what your initial thoughts are, understanding that this could be a widening crisis in the Mideast? Start with Gary. Yeah, well, anybody hopefully. else would like to jump in? Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, aside from the humanitarian crisis, ho hopefully this does, doesn't spread um, because, you know, the implications, of course, are, are extraordinary, um, extraordinarily bad, potentially. But um, from a dry bulk standpoint, I think there is, well, while we do carry cargoes to Israel, it's not an export market like Ukraine in terms of grain. So we haven't, we, I don't think we'll see a, a significant impact to the dry bulk market. Um, so far, I'm not aware of a, of a change in war risk or, or, or even a meeting as of as of this hour. So, you know, I think if if anything, just pulling back, it just reiterates the need to uh, be prepared for the unexpected. If if nothing else, the last four years have shown us that we don't know what's around the corner, and and dealing with that, whether it's uh, you know, I won't go through the litany of everything we've dealt with, but, but from, from both the safety standpoint and seafarer well-being and, and what have you. So at, the, at this point, from an impact to the, to the business, I, I think it's quite limited, and hopefully that continues. But, but obviously, the humanitarian crisis is, uh, is beyond, beyond words. Yeah, and I would second the... the thought that this is not of the same order of magnitude impact on dry bulk as, say, the pandemic, which was a you know, fairly major impact. For now, my name is, for now, it depends how, how it's going to evolve as a situation. There is a worst case scenario there. Well, there's, there's a worst case scenario to, to everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did the I think the one thing, uh, I mean, I, I agree with everything Gary said. This is um, awful, obviously, what, what is going on. 
Um, and as Hamas said, it is not, it's not like COVID, it's not like the Ukraine, the Black Sea. Um, however, you know, we could see a very high spike in the price of oil at some point, which could be recessionary and, in, in, you know, and maybe an added hit on uh, what's happening right now, particularly in Europe. But in the end of the day, dry bulk shipping is 70% correlated with China. And China is still a big driving force. I think almost 40% of all commodities are somehow connected to, uh, to China. So I, I, as we've seen always with dry bulk, I think this is more about China right now anyway than, um, than the Middle East. Yeah. Just quickly, I just want to touch briefly on this, and we'll get off the geopolitical issue on Russia. The Ukraine conflict has been going on for almost two years now. Is that status quo, or do you see any changes coming out of that? Well, if that conflict, when that conflict ends, um, I would anticipate there will be a lot of reconstruction uh, in Ukraine, which is probably going to take a fair amount of dry bulk. You know, it, it, it won't be a huge percentage of the world's fleet devoted to that, but it will be noticeable. Uh, we've got dry bulk demand on the move in the fourth quarter. Um, not coincidentally, your stock prices are showing some signs of life going into the fourth quarter. Um, we're going into, going into 2024, the capacity situation is only getting better for the sector. Could you give us some sense as to how the demand side of the equation shakes out for you in 2024 as we get through the fourth quarter? Gary, you can start, please. Sure. Um, you know, I think 2023, uh, you know, the, overall, um, there's, there's uh, dry bulk demand growth, 2.8% um, on a ton mile basis. Um, but it's, it's unique in that the minor bulks have lagged, um, which we haven't really, um, hasn't been typical. And, dry, and the minor bulks, which make up about two thirds of what we carry, um, is highly correlated to GDP. Um, we expect that and projections are that'll flip going into next year, go back uh, where dry bulk demand overall will be led by the minor bulks again. Um, and, and some of the pullback has been in, in building products, steel, steel products and things like that. So we think, you know, that a normalization of, you know, with GDP um, or the correlation coming back of dry bulk demand and GDP led by minor bulks obviously would be good for, for the mid-sized sector. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned it, right? The supply side, you know, continues to improve. The, the, the fleet is aging rapidly. The mid-sized fleet is almost at its oldest. 11.8 years was the oldest average age. We're at 11.7. And yet the supply side response has been muted uh, with the order book at 9%. The last time we had a record fleet age, the order book in 2000, end of 2008 was 80% of the on the water fleet. So I think the I think the um, the supply side looks fantastic and we just uh, obviously there's been headwinds in, in in terms of demand overall but notwithstanding that as you mentioned the market's been resilient and uh, I think the uh, the other thing that's been hurting the market this year has been an unwinding of congestion and uh, I think we're we're now back to pre-covid levels which bodes well going forward. Which scenario you want me to <laughs> the market is going to go up or down? Well, uh, no, more no, nuanced. I mean, if the if your uh, if the rates are going up, um, the traffic is going up. I'm asking in a subtle way. Okay. Okay. It should be a good year for dry bulk stocks. No. That I'm trying no. to get you to no. that's, help that's, me out on this one. Okay, that's wishful thinking. And uh, of course, we can prove the story that uh, the market is going to go up if we start talking about the stimulus uh, package in the China finally working and the Chinese economy going up. The supply relatively to, or vessels relatively to demand increasing after China find their way finally for better GDP, then the market is going to go up. But there is also the scenario where the inflationary trends that we see existing and keep existing and the GDPs of the world going down because they have to go down in order for the inflation to go down. And then you have a problem in demand. You see, number 10 or 11 or 8 doesn't mean anything because everything is relative. You have supply and demand. Supply may be small based on the demand and may be big based again on the demand if the demand is is lower. 
So every time we talk about the supply and demand and the market, we have to put the things, all of them, together. We are putting, I have said that before, a different weighting on the arguments in order to prove our point. We, as Diana, we have given up the last uh, 30 years or so trying to predict the market. We take the agnostic view, and we are prepared for all the scenarios. Yeah. If you are asking Diana Shipping ourselves, what do we think about 2024? The response is going to be, sorry, we don't know. Fair enough. Hamish, you want yeah, to um, <laughs> you know, uh, Look, I, I think what's going to be very interesting about 2024, among other interesting things about 2024, is that this will be the first year where we have the carbon intensity indicator for the whole fleet. And every ship is going to be graded A through E on its carbon intensity. And the question really is, what will charterers think about an E-rated ship versus an A-rated ship? Um, you know, will there be a discounted charter rate for an E-rated ship? And, you know, if so, um, you know, will we see the precursor to maybe a very large scrapping of the worst rated ships in the fleet? You know, one of the things about 2008 with 80% of the fleet on order in 2008 was that the earliest ship you could get delivered was going to be at a shipyard that did not in 2008 exist. And a number of those shipyards got built and they built the ships that were ordered and those ships consume an enormous amount of fuel. And as far as we can tell, that's about 30% of the fleet. So Basically, you are, sorry, Jamie, sorry to, to understand. You are saying that the charterers will force vessels to go out of the market in order for the market to go up and pay more money. I'm saying that there may be charterers who will not want an E-rated ship but want a higher rated ship, and that may lead to a price difference between the low-rated ships and the high-rated ships. I would be surprised if there was not a price difference. So I, I'm going to... I'm going to disagree a little bit with you, Hamish, which is once in a long time. I, I am not so convinced um, that CII is going to drive that. I think most ship owners and most charters recognize the flaws with CII, which is why there's a lot of time and energy being spent in trying to fix it at the IMO level right now. So I'm not 100% convinced. What I do believe is that once the European trading system, EU trading system, comes into effect on the carbon tax, as well as the EU fuel, I'll call it fuel penalty, comes into play in 2026. I think those are more of a hammer on those E-rated ships than CII is right now. John, you mentioned China. We mentioned stimulus. We're looking at uh, steel production in the so far in the third quarter globally up six and a half percent. Do you give us a sense what the dry bulk sector looks like in a more normalized growth environment for China, of maybe one or two percent rather than six percent? Well, I think we're going home at one or two percent. <laughs> Fair I, enough. I, I, you know, we're not going to be sitting up on this panel. I, I mean, so first of all, that is definitely not anywhere near our even low case assumption for for China. I just. I do not believe the, uh, the Chinese government will allow that to happen. They cannot allow that to happen from a political standpoint. Um, where we wind up in terms of GDP growth, I, that, I think that's tough. I will say to people outside of shipping, you talk to them and they think China is a complete mess, and it certainly is on the, on the housing side. However, we have seen this year iron ore imports up 7% year on year. We've seen double-digit growth on the coal side. We've seen growth on the bauxite side. I think the coal, that might be somewhat of a risk. You know, we're certainly not going to see the growth rates on coal, and, and it, it could possibly go down. But you've got the bauxite trade that is continuing to increase. Iron ore volumes next year will continue to, uh, to increase. I, uh, I mostly agree with Gary. I, I'm a little hesitant on whether we tip a little further into recession globally or not. I, I don't know the answer to that, um, which will certainly affect um, Europe um, and more of the mid-sized ships, which we also have exposure to. But um, 
you know, I, again, I fall back on the supply side, and we, we all say it over and over again. And um, I think that gives us a lot of protection. And, and the way that we've set up Genco anyway, with the with a very very low leverage profile, you know, we can we can play offense at any time. You know, I, I would add. John mentioned the word protection. You know, we we've had just. With the exception of 2020, we've had just such low scrapping, and that, of course, is there's two things that have driven the age of the the average age of the fleet up. One is one is a lack of scrapping; the other is a few ships coming into the market. But you know, this year we've averaged 30 years age on scrapping for the mid-sized fleet, and historically it's been around 25 and a half years. And so you you have this pent-up ability to to scrap many ships that are hanging around. Why are they hang around? Because Rates have overall been good, notwithstanding you know weakness in the summer, um, but ships are making money and people see the supply side. So you know in a, in a weak environment, you have this relief valve, if you will, with the ability to scrap many of these ships, and and we're starting to see it. You know ships can't last forever. Actually, driving in this morning, I, I wasn't I wasn't at behind the wheel. I was looking at an SSY report, and seven seven ships scrapped last month, mid-sized ships. Last year it was nine for the whole year. So we're starting to see a supply side response in the scrapping because it, like I said, it hasn't ha been happening for years, and obviously that that's a positive as well. Hopefully we don't need it because of a weakness on the demand side, but it's there if necessary. Giannis, any comments on China over and above what John and uh, Gary shared with us? No, thank you. There you go. <laughs> Hamish? I'm going to be kind. Well, you know, I, I think it is interesting that while China's economy is clearly weak, um, their, their importation of dry bulk is as strong as we were expecting when we expected the Chinese economy to really boom as they came out of their COVID restrictions. And, you know, the problem has not been China, you know, in the first half of this year. It's been imports into the rest of the world. Of, of dry bulk, um, and you know, hopefully the rest of the world will sort of head out of of uh, recession. Uh, we do see strength building up in the rest of the world. So, thank you, Hamish. Yeah. Um, all of you have different leverage levels on your balance sheets. Um, could you talk about uh, managing debt levels within the enterprise? and the balance between uh, an efficient capital structure and reducing or eliminating the financial risk in your company. I'll start with John, if I could, or? Sure, well, you know, we have, uh, we've paid down um, over 60% of our debt over the last two years, um, and we have set the company up to be a very high dividend, low leverage, if, uh, if, if no leverage model, so that we can continue to pay a dividend throughout all the cycles. And I'll go back to what I said before, we always want to be playing offense. If the market uh, booms, then we have a lot of cash that we can return to shareholders, and the company does very well. If the market uh, stumbles and, and hits a short-term recessionary, well, then that gives us the opportunity to buy vessels because of, uh, because of our low leverage profile. Um, if I look at what we're concentrated on outside of the dividend, it is, uh, it's fleet renewal as well. Um, I think for us to go out and use cash to do a large transaction right now is not on the table. Um, and I emphasize use cash, certainly, for, uh, you know, using equity would be a, a different story as long as it's above NAV. Um, but we do think the fleet renewal side is still important. Um, it's interesting what's happening on the, on the value side. Values have been very sticky, uh, particularly going through the third quarter, surprisingly sticky. Um, and we're still in the sort of, particularly for eco ships, which are much more difficult to uh, to get your hands on. You know, you're in that 55 to 60th percentile from a value standpoint historically. Um, so it, it's, you know, I, I, I feel it's sort of a weird time, and I don't, I'm interested to hear what the rest of these guys have to say, but it's, um, we're sort of in this middle area where it's very difficult to make a decision to go big or, or pull back. Um, and so what, that's why we're concentrating more on renewing the fleet rather than some, than some very large transactions. Just to follow up on the debt level side, yeah. though. I mean, 
there is a prudent level of debt that you'd like to keep on the balance sheet for capital efficiency, or um, do you want to completely eliminate that part of the risk in your balance Look, sheet? we've been very public. We want to be you know, net debt zero, and we're at about 10% on a net debt standpoint Great. right now. And again, that comes from wanting to be able to pay a dividend no matter what the quarter throws at you, um, or even a couple quarters. I mean, what we have found is that supply shocks last for a very long time. But demand shocks are very, fairly short. And with a cash flow break even rate of somewhere around $9,000 a day, if you go back historically and look at operating cash flow on our fleet, or a fleet like ours going back 20 years, there are very few quarters where you dip down below that. And that's why we've set the company up with the optionality. We have the fleet renewal. We have the reserve that we can dip into, which we have done the last uh, two quarters to smooth out the dividend. Good. Yeah, I mean, we, we're, our net debt fleet is around 35%, and, and we feel that's a good level, prudent use of, uh, use of leverage. Um, I mean, as you mentioned, it's, 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 it's about a balance, right, and, and finding the, the right cost of capital, and that combined with the fact that we were able to go out and, and, and hedge our uh, term debt um, back a few years ago at very low levels gives us a good, good blended cost of capital and one that enables us, we think, on a on a basis to, to return capital to shareholders, which you know we've been able to do um, to the tune of almost 150 million over the last eight quarters since we instituted our dividend policy, which is uh, short and sweet. It's 30 percent of net income with a minimum of 10 cents. So, so you know that's something we feel comfortable with, and we, we like the balance of, of where we are. And it's enabled us also to to do meaningful fleet renewal. You know, we had one of the oldest fleets uh, when I got to Eagle, and we've done we've done 36 vessel acquisitions over the last number of years and been able to keep keep the age uh, down right around at just at 10 years. Thank you, Gary. Giannis? I have to admit that uh, all the companies that are here, certainly in most of the dry bulk companies, they have managed their balance sheet uh, uh, much better than uh, what they have done in the previous cycle. As we say in operations on our vessels, there is a, a policy that has to do with lessons learned. And uh, I think that the dry bulk sector has demonstrated that uh, managing the balance sheet, taking us as an example, I have to say, uh, because this is what we have been doing from the beginning uh, since 2005, we have been firstly managing our balance sheet rather than uh, thinking about expanding our fleet. And, uh, we are very glad to see other shipping companies, dry bulk companies, having done the same now. And they, their balance sheets are, are really strong, and they will not end up in a situation where they have to refinance or uh, to raise equity in a dilutive manner for the shareholders in case the market goes the other way. Great. Thank you. Lastly, Hamish. Yeah. So. Um we have about 30% net debt to asset value, which is, is pretty moderate. Um, we're paying down almost 200 million of debt every year. Um, and, uh, you know, we would be perfectly fine with net debt of zero. We want to keep some gross debt because we think it's valuable to have relationships with the bank lenders. But frankly, we don't think it's particularly required to have debt from a financial performance point of view. We don't pay tax because we don't owe tax uh, anywhere. And so we don't get a benefit from interest payments, uh, no tax benefit from interest payments. Um, and, you know, we have uh, 43,000 ownership days per year, so $1,000 a day up in charter rates is $43 million to the bottom line. We have more than enough operating leverage. Um, and, um, you know, we, we are very happy paying, you know, large dividends. Uh, you know, I think since the beginning of 2021, we've paid almost a billion dollars in dividends. Um, we're just, you know, deleveraging, preparing for fleet renewal. But I have to say, we sold um, eight ships recently uh, and uh, banked a bunch of cash as a result. And uh, having thought about whether to use that cash to pay down debt 
buy ships to renew the fleet or buy back shares, we decided that the best use was to buy back shares. So we, we bought back $185 million in shares uh, a couple of weeks ago. Thank you, Hamish. Um, I just want to touch on a subject that nobody wants to talk about. And as one of the earlier panelists said, investors really don't care about, at least on the short term. But all of you have comprehensive ESG programs, um, very easy to find on your website. Could you share from both an investor uh, perspective some highlights of your ESG programs and why they should, why investors should pay attention to them? Gary, we can start with you. Sure. I mean, it, you know, first of all, I, I don't really agree with that. I think there are investors who are interested in, in ESG, and rightfully so. Um, it matters. It matters in terms of uh, being a good corporate citizen, but it also matters in terms of return for shareholders. And, and there's, there's clearly, clearly um, data that shows that. But, you know, ESG on the environmental front, and I think everyone up here, you know, their companies do, are, are working towards, towards, you know, this getting to zero. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's a, an incredible challenge. It's going to take a lot, a lot of work, capital, and time, but, but, you, but you have to start. And, uh, you know, we're working on, on making our ships as efficient as possible. And again, as are, as are the other uh, people up here, we're using uh, advanced weather routing, we're using advanced hull coatings, robotic uh, hull cleaning skates, things like that. Because frankly, it's good for the bottom line, but it's, you know, a ton of CO2 saved. Doesn't matter when it is, it's, it's a ton saved. But there's also, you know, the, the, the social part of it, you know, and that's really been coming to, into focus over the last few years. First with COVID, the seafarers um, challenge with repatriating seafarers. Um, then, you know, with the war in Ukraine, uh, housing our, um, some of our seafarers and their families in countries out, outside of Ukraine. Um, and, and most recently, we put in a health insurance program for all of our seafarers and for their families, um, and which we think is an important you know, step forward um, for, for us and for the company. And, and in terms of corporate governance, you know, having independent board and, and alignment with shareholders, we think is important. So, I mean, I, obviously, I could talk a lot longer on, on each, of the, uh, each of the letters, but um, you know, I think I've touched on some of the highlights. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to, That's to some of my panelists to continue. John? Mm -hmm. So we have, um, we've been able to reduce our CO2 emissions by 15% over two years. Um, I, think, um, I, I think the environment we're in, at least right now, is, is a little more of a marathon than a 50-yard dash, as much as we would all like it to, uh, to go very quickly. Uh, but we break it down into short-term items that we're doing. Um, again, I think most everyone on this panel has done this, but we've installed energy-saving devices, um, modified hulls, paints. Um, we have completely digitalized our fleet in terms of putting flow meters and other equipment on board so we can measure fuel efficiency real-time and make adjustments. The other thing that we're trying to do, though it's not always the easiest, is um, create more efficiency on the operation side, meaning we don't need to go 100 miles an hour from point A to point B and then wait three weeks. Now, some of that is driven by charters, and it, it's a very difficult task, but it is something that we're working on more and more. And Gary just pointed this out. All of these things have very quick payback periods. So not only are you reducing your carbon footprint, you're burning less fuel, and that drops right down to, uh, to the bottom line. On, on the governance side, um, you know, transparent U US filer, you know, we, um, we have uh, definitely diversity on our board. We formed a completely separate new ESG committee about a year ago. That is, that is solely focused on, uh, on those issues, no related party transactions. And you know, we have uh, the fortunate spot of, of being ranked number one by uh, Weber Research out of 64 companies for the past uh, three years. So it, it's been um, something we've been focused on. Longer term, we're doing a lot of studies on, on methanol and ammonia right now. And um, eventually, we'll be able to execute on that as well. Okay. 
Hey, Mish, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah, guys. so I completely agree with, with John that governance is, is a very important point. And I think, frankly, from the point of view of the shareholders and uh, investors who are not yet shareholders, governance maybe is the most important part of ESG. Uh, and, you know, it's certainly it's, it's a very relevant point in this industry. Uh, having a strong board, having a board that takes its fiduciary obligations to shareholders very seriously, uh, having a serious compensation committee that believes that management should be paid when shareholders make money is very important. And, and I think we have, we have that. Um, and, um, you know, having that sort of strong governance has, has led to our costs being, you know, among the lowest in the industry, both operating costs and overhead. And, you know, basically it makes management think like shareholders. And in, in fact, you know, we are shareholders. So, um, you know, that's, that's very important. And, and as far as the environmental side, you know, that's, that's money on the bottom line. Fuel prices are going up. Almost anything you can do to save fuel has a payback that is becoming quite reasonable. Uh, and so uh, we're looking into basically all the technologies that are available, and, and we've, we've been doing quite a bit uh, of that. And you know, as far as social involvement, I think the, the shareholders care less about that, but we've been taking that quite seriously as well. Yes, you can uh, we also in Diana Shipping, we take this matter very seriously for the last uh, three years, I would say. And uh, we have uh, three pillars of our own that are related to the ESG matters. We, we certainly uh, value the environmental stewardship and we are moving towards uh, a low carbon future. Of course, as regards our personnel, we are protecting and, development, and developing uh, our people. The, their well-being is very important for us. And also, as regards the operational uh, excellence and uh, governance matters, uh, we, are strongly, we strongly believe in the ethical and uh, reliable way of doing business. Uh, there is no way we can avoid the ESG matters uh, not only it's a good thing for, 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 for all the industry, but there is no other way forward. Uh, we have to be at the upfront of these things and show to everybody how these things uh, should be followed uh, uh, precisely and uh, carefully. Thank you. Well, we have just under two minutes left, so I'm going to ask for a brief answer. Uh, right now, asset values are a certain level. At these levels, would you be a buyer or seller of assets here? We'll start with Giannis and just on the move down. Short answer. Pardon? A short answer you want? A short answer. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Should I get Was another question? Enough? You want another question or you no, just no, want to move no. it down? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're, we're very constructive on the market, having said that. You know, we, we've done quite a few asset acquisitions, so we don't feel under pressure to go out and do more at the moment. But, but we, we, we think the future is bright based on the supply side. So if I, all, all things being equal, I'd be a buyer, not a seller. John? Yeah, I agree with Gary. We're, we're constructive on the market, um, at least over the next couple of years. Um, and it's mainly backed by uh, the supply side, and we eventually think China is going to come back, though I can't tell you what month or quarter that's going to be. And I think the rest of the world will as well. But um, so, again, we're going to be concentrated on fleet renewal. But if, but if you ask me what I would invest in in shipping, I'd be buying shipyards right now. That, that's because we're talking 27,000 ships between containers, tankers, and dry bulk that are going to have to ultimately be replaced by the time we get to 2050, and yard capacity is down 65% from where it was. So at that, if you wanted to ask me where I'd put my money, personally, that's what I would do. But as I said, fleet renewal from a company standpoint is what we're concentrated on. And Hamish, 
So we, we are buyers of designs we like, assuming you know, we can, uh, even in, a, any, in any given market, there's a pretty wide range of price you can end up with in a negotiation. But if we get the price we like for a design we like, we're buyers. For designs we don't like, if we can get a good price, we're sellers, as we recently sold eight ships that were, you know, we thought, time to sell in, in, in the relatively strong market, um, you know, given their fuel consumption. You know, what's interesting is the liquidity in the S&P market right now in bulkers, um, obviously tankers, it exists as well, but again, we saw rates come down eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a day, right, in the Cape size sector, but values did not really come down. In fact, you saw quite a bit of deal making in S&P transactions in the third and, and the beginning of uh, already this, uh, this quarter. So I find that very interesting for dry bulk. Usually dry bulk has this massive correlation with what freight rates do in values and we just haven't seen it the last few quarters. Giannis, Sorry, yes, last because word. I'm going to get fired if I don't mention that because I forgot. <laughs> we are one of the first companies that we order to uh, methanol burning uh, cancer maxes. Uh, for delivery late 2027 and early 2028. And that shows to, to everybody our commitment to moving towards uh, a low carbon future. I had to say that. Sorry. <laughs> Don't apologize My boss to me. Not be happy with that. <laughs> anyway, uh, that does it for time. Thank you very much. Very appreciate it. Uh,